welcome to this edition of the High Strangeness Factor, copyrighted on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I am your host, Steve Ward. And without any preamble, uh, Brandy, welcome back as co-host. Thank you so much for having me back. And it's great to have you back because you and I have been doing a, a series of shows. In fact, uh, there's one coming out today. Of course, uh, when I say today, this show will come out quite a bit later. But the one we did with uh, Linda Fink, uh, kind of on the same theme. So uh, there are shows that we have done, one that's coming right out, and this show that will be released in a little while, uh, uh, all kind of on the same theme. And that is primarily on the high strangeness going on on the Beast of Bray Road. Uh, the Beast of Bray Road, of course, is the book that Linda Godfrey wrote back in the early 90s when she discovered that there were these upright canid reports uh, just east of Elkhorn, and, and not just Elkhorn, but as, as Donna Fink pointed out, these things are going on all over the place, all over uh, south, southern Wisconsin and other parts of the U.S. and even the world. So just to kind of recap, you and I, uh, a couple, a few weeks ago, attended the Beast of Bray Road conference that, that Donna Fink uh, had in uh, in Elkhorn, and it was a very successful first time conference, and uh, 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 good speakers, good attendance. But that night, we went to uh, Lee Hample's farm, and it was billed as the hayride, and uh, Lee was going to show some of his uh, photographs, and the photographs were mind blowing, and uh, we'll talk about that as we go on. And, and fortunately, now he was, uh, he's kept a lot of these very close to his vest, but fortunately, and we weren't going to be talking about the, uh, um, I'm getting a little bit of weird static. Does anybody else hear that? Like a little no. feedback thing? Okay, good. I'm probably... getting a little feedback too, so. Oh, okay. Well, it's not, not that big a deal. I think we'll just uh, steam ahead. Uh, the, the thing is that in the, uh, in the, uh, the YouTube video that the Bucks County uh, investigators did. We do get to see some of those photographs, a few of them, but these are, are photographs that no one has seen. So along with their investigation, we've seen some of that reveal. Um, let's see, uh, is there anything you would like to chime in about this? No, it was just an unbelievable conference, um, you know, especially for a first year of the conference. Um, I just can't wait to see how great, it, if it started out that great, how great it's going to get year after year. It it was just, like you said, the, the photos were mind-blowing. You know, I thought I was going to a simple, not a simple hayride, but a hayride, you know, around somebody's farm. But I was not prepared for for what we got to see that night. So. And and, and also on the with the video, we're going to talk a lot, uh, a lot more about. But yes. I saw I saw Eric have the same uh, reaction that we did when he's talking. He's talking to Lee Hample, and he's saying we're just blown away by by these <laughs> yes. these images. And right. uh, and we're, so we're going to get the feedback from everybody that was out there investigating that night. So I want to just uh, take it a little bit further. The next day, you and I decided to see if we couldn't take a stroll along Bray Road. <laughs> so <laughs> and we and we did actually find a. Uh, a place, uh, private property, we got permission to park because ladies and gentlemen, they don't let you park on Bray Road. No, but that being said, as you and I were cruising along Bray Road to see if we could find a place, uh, we noticed there were a couple of vehicles off the side of the road. There were some people there with cameras and, and uh, like doing interviews in the cornfield. And I thought, who the hell are these interlopers? You know, they really, <laughs> they, they really looked like out of staters to me. But then I thought, you and I were out of staters and interlopers too. So anyway, <laughs> we stopped and the rest is history. So we got a chance to talk to them a little bit, found out that they're going to be doing this investigation and uh, the rest is history. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and uh, introduce everybody and, uh, and we'll get started. <clears throat> and let me see here. Jazz musician Eric Mintel is the head of a unique tourism business and TV show called Bucks County Paranormal Investigation. BCPI seeks out and features historical locations in the country that also have a paranormal history. Eric features the videos on his TV shows, which are featured on Amazon Fire, Roku, and Apple TV through Princeton Television every Saturday night at 10 p.m. Eastern 
and on service electric TV two in the Lehigh Valley in over 66,000 homes every Sunday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. Bucks County Paranormal Investigations and Eric Mantell Investigates are bringing the public new and old places and locations to visit in a genre that is only getting more and more popular in today's world. Ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, werewolves, and more. Dominic Sattel joined the team in 2018. He is a spirit medium. He's also a mechanical estimator by trade and a business owner. BCPI gets a preview of what they are in investigating thanks to Dominic's insights. Dominic has always been fascinated by the paranormal and the unexplained ever since he was a child. He has been in many investigations with BCPI and there will be a lot more to come. And I'm also happy that to add uh, this time, Ellen Collins, another member of the team. And she's originally from Michigan and it turns out we grew up just miles apart. Mm -hmm. and, we have, and she has investigated the paranormal her whole life. By day, she is a paralegal working for a real estate firm. And by night, she researches cryptids, the paranormal, and everything that goes bump in the night. Ellen represents the Wisconsin branch of Bucks County Paranormal Investigations and enjoys working with Eric and Dominic in their adventures. Welcome you all to the High Strangers Factor. Hey, Steve. How you doing? Thanks, Steve. Uh, great to have you guys here. I, I think someone might be a little bit too close to the mic. I can hear breathing. Is that, I don't know, is that possible? Anyway, just kind of kind of watch it. I. Uh, uh, it might be the beat. It might be the beast of Dominic Sattel. <laughs> ah. Well, as, as long as we as long as we have a mundane explanation, I'm I'm good with that. <laughs> did you eat, Dominic? Did you eat yet? <laughs> I did eat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, go go ahead. Was was about to say something. No, that was oh, just, okay. just funny. Okay. OK, well, it's, it's really great to have you all here. Yes, we're going to have to laugh because, you know, I watched the videos again. I watched the uh, the beast of uh, the uh, Bray Road uh, uh, investigation you did. And also, uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit about the uh, the Jersey Devil investigation, actually the Bigfoot investigation in the Pine Barrens. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, OK. <laughs> so, by the way, uh, you guys do a great job in, in the production values in these videos. Thank you. That's that's uh, all the editor. That's all Eric. Okay, <laughs> he, he makes me look good. <laughs> and and uh, the music, the background music, you compose? No, the, a lot of that is canned music, but a okay. lot of, some of the music I use for my jazz quartet. And okay. actually, and actually, Steve, uh, you just mentioned that we're actually coming up with a uh, theme song now for uh, Bucks County Paranormal Investigations, which my good buddy and fellow investigator Dave Antonell has arranged for for the video production. So it's gonna be a really, really cool theme. It's, an, it's a theme that I wrote a long time ago, but we've re, repurposed it for uh, for BCPI. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And it sounds really cool. So it's gonna be a really catchy, uh, something like, you know, people will associate with us, you know, so it's gonna be very, very catchy. So can't wait to show that, you know, let everybody hear that uh, probably in the next video that we do. Sounds really good. Now, I'm going to encourage people to, uh, if you haven't heard uh, uh, two videos, uh, uh, two programs before this, uh, you should go back and check the our first encounter with the Bucks County boys and then the uh, the interview with uh, uh, Donna Fink, because that, they're all kind of uh, will fit together. And um, I guess I guess why don't we just kind of uh, refresh people's memory? How did this all come about? I know that uh, uh, mm -hmm. Ellen is is uh, your uh, your lady on the ground in Wisconsin. Uh, yes. But uh, I, uh, how did you guys, how did this all unfold and how did you get access to Lee Hample's property? Well, we'll, we'll go right back to Ellen. Uh, you know, Ellen is the executive producer on this video. So she made this happen. I mean, we um, we basically, Ellen and I have been friends for a long time and she loves the 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 you know, BCPI and what we're doing. And one of the catchphrases that we have in the videos and a little bit of comic relief is we always say, get on the damn radio if you see or hear anything. So get on the damn radio. So we and she always loved that line. And we would always laugh about that. And so there was a real connection there. And then for what she's doing research wise in Wisconsin has had always told me about the Beast of Bray Road. 
And we had been talking about this and then, you know, a year went by or so Then, of course COVID hit. And then we had a lot of time on our hands and we were doing some stuff and do, we were actually doing videos during that time. But then the subject of Beast of Bray Road came up again. And I said to Ellen, I said, well, maybe we could find, you know, people that we might want to sponsor it and whatnot. Anyway, so long story short, Ellen sponsored the video and that's why we're there. It was all because of Ellen. And um, then after getting everything together for the video getting out there, I had seen Lee uh, Hampel on a program called Paranormal Declassified in, and that was on the Travel Channel in December of 2020. And just, you know, it was one of those things where Lee coming across on the screen just looked like a such a very accessible guy, which he is in real life. Um, and I just said, you know, just something made me say, I'm going to reach out to this guy. And I reached out to him. We had a, that night that I saw the the, uh, the, the movie or the, uh, the series and we talked for like two hours and he was telling me he and then he sent me emails of some of the pictures and the tracks. And I said, well, my team would love to come out and do a video, and we would love to do a video investigation, investigating the product. He had no problem with that. He was like, yeah, come on out, you know. Um, so that's when Alan and I talked about it uh, in July. I think it was July of this year, 2021, and we, we yep. came up with it. And that's how uh, – and then we and then by October, so we got out there on uh, – we spent a couple of days. So it was October 2nd through October 4th, and then we went back home on the 4th. But on the on the 2nd – which just by happenstance, we had no idea, just happened to be the first Beast of Bray Road conference. Wow. So, and that's how we met Steve and 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 El, all of us, Ellen, Dominic, and then Ellen's son, Scott, was there. He was the one that was helping film and doing the drone work. And we literally jumped up on each other in the corn. That's how we found, <laughs> and you, and you, you know, it was just an unbelievable... I mean, where else could we say that we met in a cornfield? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, really. Literally, the children of the corn. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and that's how that that's how it all came about. And then uh, that night, uh, that was on Saturday. I think we met. And then uh, that night, we had gone to a dinner, and um, that, at dinner, we had the idea. Like I asked Lee, I said, Lee, when we come down to do the to do the investigation. Are we able to bait the area? Because you have to ask the owners. You just can't come down there and just, you know, bring bait down there. And he said that was fine. He told me that too. He's like, you know, you, you know, ask permission, which we fully, fully did. And uh, so we took a couple of steak bones that we had at dinner. We saved those and put them down at the bait site during the day. On that was on Sunday. Yeah, I so picked them pretty early. clean though. Eric. Was yeah, we did. We picked them I pretty picked, clean. I picked but, them pretty clean, you know. Yes, you, did. <laughs> you did, you did. <laughs> but we so we put so we put those out there earlier in the day. And the 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 thing that was going through, well, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I'm just kind of recapping from like from day one what happened here. And and Ellen and Dominic just cut me off, or Steve, Brandy, whatever, just cut me off if you have any other questions there. But um so the the video, you know, we stopped around. We talked to a lot of witnesses, um, and it was amazing how people were just so open about talking about their experiences with the Beast of Bray Road. Because um, some of the people right where near where Lee lives are not open about it, and they're very they just don't want to talk about it at all. That's amazing to me because, well, I mean, being so close, I, I you know, I, I don't know, I. I I, uh, I'm surprised that they're they're you know reluctant to talk about it. But I had gotten an, a witness from Donna, who had to be anonymous because um, you know his job kind of kept him from being on camera. But uh, but he told me uh, his experiences, and I'll be damned if it wasn't the same experiences that we had that night of the investigation. I, I think was he the gentleman that spoke at the uh, conference? I don't think so. Okay. There don't. was somebody that uh, from near that area that had an experience that we don't know what his name was. He just, uh, mm -hmm. and he kept was very, you know, cautious. Same deal. He was worried about his uh, place where he worked. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, it was, the whole experience was incredible. And then after meeting you guys, we, um, we did some more interviews and, um, we went back to Lee's farm, and that's when, where you see on the video itself, uh, the pictures that Lee showed us. Right. Uh, 
very very strange for stu uh, stuff right dom i mean just incredible I, it, was, okay. it was incredible and we also we talked to lee's brother fred yes and, good guy oh absolutely phenomenal yeah. but the the information that he gave and he was a skeptic and mm -hmm. i mean a very big skeptic until he experienced it then right. his whole attitude changed so right. and you know it just you know he was he's a computer programmer worked for ibm very analytical thinking very you know you got to prove it before i believe it and it, it was proven to him and you know it just unbelievable yeah but i mean even even when we were out there we got to meet donna and mm -hmm. we got to talk to her and talk to some of her friends that that were there for the conference that had some experience with the dog man and it's just phenomenal i mean it, it, all, every like the stars aligned and everything was perfect Oh, so everything was yeah. We everything, couldn't ask for everything, anything better. Everything was perfect. I mean, everything like Dom said, it just seemed like everything lined up perfectly. I mean, it was incredible how what we did there. And going back to Fred, I forgot to mention that too. Uh, we went to Lee's. Uh, uh, I guess this was Saturday. We went out and talked to Fred before before the conference. This was before the conference at Lee's, and we talked to Fred. And Fred took us out to the area as well to this one area. And uh, so Fred was just amazing, man. I mean, just the recall that he had of them finding these weird prints with no foot pattern. And then uh, here's uh, one thing that happened right off the gate, right, off, right out of the gate. So Ellen's son, Scott, um, is he has a, a Phantom Flights FPV. It's a drone company. And a great, great, uh, he's a drone maker and he's, he's an incredible technician. Um, he had a drone. He was following us in the field as we went down there. He was trying to find us. He, was, he usually wears these uh, virtual reality glasses while he's doing the drone. Well, this particular thing, he could not see where we were in this particular instance. Like we disappeared from his screen out mm -hmm. in that. So the other thing about that field is there's been a lot of ele electronic disturbances there. Lee's trail cams weren't working at times. Now let's and, tell people where this field is. This is the on the opposite side of Bray Road from where Lee Hample's property is. Yeah, it's about two okay. tenths of a mile from from Bray Road, and his property backs right up to Bray Road. Okay, yeah. it's, and, it's and, between his where his barn is and Bray yeah. Road. It's in between his barn and Bray Road. Now, okay. when Scott, when Scott, when we were on Bray Road, Steve, what Scott did was he went and did a drone shot of the cornfield because we wanted to see what was going on in the cornfield. Well, we found out that in the corn, there were huge uh, outlines and pathways going to Lee's property to, to out to Bray Road and then out to the quarry. Yep. Wow. Huh. Yeah, that was really weird. I yeah. mean, these were, and these paths were huge. I mean, they're big, like big, like something big was going through there. And it was all and, not, and it was really all knocked down. Yeah, I, I want to ask some questions. Oh, go ahead, Dominic. I, I was going to say the corn itself, there were certain areas where it was knocked down, but it wasn't from a vehicle or a quad or anything right. like that because there was still corn standing up in the middle, untouched, unscathed. Okay. So it was a path and it was a wider path, but it wasn't done and there was no tire tracks or anything like that. So it, it definitely was not man-made. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I want to go back. I and, to say. OK, I, I want to go back in time a little bit uh, when this Lee started first finding this and when he was first written about under the name, I think, Roy Smith in mm -hmm. Monsters Among Us by Linda Godfrey. But but very quickly in, in your video. Uh, Fred, uh, there's a picture of a weird looking print. I mean, there's no toes or pads or anything that you're referring to. And but that's that's different than the the beast footprints, right? Where you can see the five toes and the pad and the heel. That was the yeah, that was the uh, and that those are the, the pads. The that's the seven pad track that they found. The ones that I showed you were the ones that no one has seen because they didn't show those because Lee's had those. Those were the very first kind of tracks that he found there. You, there was probably the foot pattern in there, but you couldn't see it. Um, 
Am, am I, is there like a big echo or something too? I hear a lot of static for some reason. Yeah, there, there's there's something. It just it, it just happens. There's some kind of uh, a little bit of interference, but I don't know how to get rid of it. So I'll turn. The, I'll I, turn. I, I can hear everybody loud and clear. So that's okay. that's good. So yeah, so those tracks were really incredible, and um, so those were one of the some of the first tracks. So yeah, I didn't put the other uh, seven pad track in there only because people have already seen that. Well, actually. Uh, uh, Brandy and I, years ago, we went to the Dogman Symposium in uh, uh, Defiance, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, 19, 19, 2016? <laughs> yeah. Not ever. <laughs> hey, just, just, just call it a senior moment. What can I say? Uh, <clears throat> but, 2016, uh, yeah, 2016. And, and actually, Brandy and I didn't know each other then. But, <laughs> but Linda was showing... Uh, at least I can't remember if I if I knew her. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but but Linda was showing us photographs of Lee Hample's property, and we had no idea that that's what it was. The strange mists going through, yeah. and she was talking about the the originally the strange phenomena that he was experiencing. And he told us at the uh, at the presentation when he was showing us photographs he, that he he this thing started happening. He found out about Linda Godfrey and contacted her and told her. He said, you know. If I'd seen one of your books two or three months earlier, I would have thrown it in the trash. Mm -hmm. He's a mathematician. He's a and and you uh, when you were talking to him on the video, uh, Dominic was talking to him and said that uh, uh, you know he was pointing out that Lee approached this from a a very rational, very scientific standpoint. Uh, but you know, it, it, can you imagine? I mean, you go to this property and your neighbors are telling you, uh, by the way, there's a werewolf on your property in those backwoods. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah, and he, you're right. He didn't believe it. Yeah. No, not at all. And, and there wasn't he didn't have any cameras out there at first either. It was after a no. while. And he, he even he even accused Fred of, uh, of, of his trap camera not, not working properly. Yeah. <laughs> And, mm -hmm. and right in your video, Fred says, well, it might be old, but it should be working fine. So yeah. uh, that's that's, you know, we'll get to the the oddities of some of the phenomena. So it was uh, and that was what, about 10 years ago that uh, Lee started noticing this phenomenon. Well, he bought the property in 2007, but he didn't start farming there until 2011. But he didn't start getting activity or he didn't notice the activity until 2014. That's when he started getting activity. So it's been about. Yeah, I guess it's been about seven, eight years now. But um, Linda has been, Linda Godfrey has been collecting information about different phenomena and sightings um, off of Bray Road since the 90s. So mm -hmm. it's been happening for a lot longer than Lee has even owned the property. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this, I mean, this is back from the 1930s is when the first real instances started to occur right yeah and ellen so, uh, really ellen had a really great uh thing that she, tell them what you were talking to fred about the uh the eyes about uh, the eye glow the tapetum lucidum yeah where uh you know it, eyes are not supposed to glow internally um f for any period of time you know if if you have a tapetum humans don't have but uh some animals not all mammals have uh, you see it only when a headlight comes by or somebody flashes a light and then it goes away. Um, something that's internally generated, um, gosh, that's, that's not from here. That, that's from outer space or something. That's just not something that would happen in a, in a mammal here in, in, in the world. Right. And, and Ellen, isn't that something now you, you, you're one of your areas you look at are, are cryptids in general. That's yeah. something that seems to come up in some not all bigfoot reports and other types of cryptids it does in bigfoot reports a lot of times they are seen as glowing either bright yellow or bright orange and okay. uh you know and they're fluid you know they're just stagnant they're not uh you know like they're internally generated so they're they're there's uh the whole the whole eye when the whole eye moves that's all you see is the orange or the yellow or the green. You don't see a pupil or you don't see them blink. And if they blink, you know, you see the orange or you see the yellow. You don't see, you know, uh, an eyeball, you know. Right. And that's, so that's, 
that's, that's right. so bizarre. Yeah, uh, and of very, course, we know Stan Gordon documented uh, very, very strange Bigfoot reports. You know, mm -hmm. if Bigfoot isn't strange enough in, in Pennsylvania in the mid 70s, but had a green eye glow. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I, you know, and some some of the uh, Bigfoots that have been uh, uh, seen in the swamp areas and stuff, they're saying that the creature was affected by the gases in the swamp. And so that is what has changed the eye color from a normal eye to a glowing eye, is that it's either a sulfur or a methane or something in the swamp that this creature has been going through for years and years and years, has and it has just adapted to that feature so that it, it can actually see better at night with that feature. If it's, you know, and they, they can't hunt that much during the day. They're, they're out during the day, but nighttime is when they hunt. So. How do we explain the Mothman with its piercing red glowing eyes mm. uh, that, that uh, showed up you know, in uh, the Ohio Valley in the mid-60s? He's, he's electrically charged, the Mothman. I do believe he has a, a giant connection because he's always found either by bridges or by... Um, um, big electrical towers. And um, I, I know, I don't know if you've ever watched the Mountain Monsters or the Ames team, they did the Mothman thing and they actually showed a, a guy who had a video of the Mothman up there. And he was, it was large, it was very large, but he was in the uh, wires and in the electric tower. And, uh, you know, he said the eyes were glowing and I do think he gets his energy. They get their energy somehow from that you know static mm. energy or something but they do get their energy just flows right through them I, i've and, only seen it as a oh go ahead oh no that's about it I, I just that I, i'm i'm kind of known as the mothman guy i yeah. i'm one of the guys at the uh at the festival and so forth i went to a, a a bigfoot conference in ann arbor recently to speak about cryptids in general and everybody introduced me as the Mothman guy. So I, I guess that, that's your mistake. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but it's, it's quite, we, we won't spend much time on that, on this because we've got to, we want to talk about your video. But it, that there's some aspects of it where it seemed like it may be physical, but it didn't flap its wings. Uh, it, it didn't, uh, it would take off straight like a helicopter. Other aspects almost made it seem like an apparition. But John Keel, the author of the Mothman Prophecies, also mm -hmm had some reports of people that saw it close up that heard some kind of a humming, like it might have been mechanical or some kind of a drone or something. Wow. It just it just a complete paradox. You know, you you take your pick. But but isn't that true with uh, many of the now uh, uh, Lee Hample? Hasn't he also seen other types of creatures on the property? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's yeah, tell us about that. Oh, well, I mean, you know, that was the thing he said right away there. You know, when he had all of this really weird stuff happening, the thing that really got me was when he told us about the raccoon that he put on the property uh, to try to see what was going on with this thing. So he put it down in the area that has had a lot of activity. He put this raccoon down in th like three feet tall, uh, tall grass, and he put it down, plopped it right down in the middle of the grass. He comes back a about a day or so later, and the raccoon was split open and all the insides were taken out, but none of the grass was disturbed. Right. And then the next, a couple of days later. Let the, me just stop you quickly, Eric. Was, was this the time when the incision was like, almost like a surgical cut on the right? Yeah, yeah. It, was, okay. yeah. It, was, it was a clean cut, yeah, that would, which was very disturbing. So that it was just clean open. And then like a couple of days after that, after he had that experience, he went back again. Now this time it was 15 feet away in a, in a, the raccoon was 15 feet away in a little pile, but yet the grass was still not disturbed. And mm -hmm. we were talking about, well, you know, he was saying maybe a hawk could have come in there and that's what he was thinking could have done it. But again, nothing was disturbed. Like something picked it up, took it out of there and brought it, you know, to another place. So that was very, very interesting in, in that respect. And uh, so, then he's had lights, weird lights on the property. He's had, and he showed us video of that, which you'll see in the video. Um, strange orbs. He's got this mist. The mist that we saw was a mist that that he showed us in a picture. Basically, when the mist came up, it obscured Lee. Lee was in the picture on the trail cam. 
and you could see this mist and you can't you can only see half of Lee's body and then like a second later the mist is gone and it, it was clear as a bell but he saw nothing but when he, he saw, nothing. saw nothing yeah he didn't see a thing he didn't see a thing yeah brandy uh, and i saw those those pictures and that that is really unnerving uh oh, yeah. because because t talk a little bit about how uh and, and and all these these pictures you showed us they're time stamped so you you see you know the day it is and the hour and so forth talk yeah. a little bit about the uh uh the carcasses the deer carcasses and so forth that disappear well he said what did he say like uh, 16 uh, he put 17 roadkill deer out there yeah. and i think 16, 16 of them went gone missing yeah nothing left of them no trails they weren't dragged away they had to be carried away because the, because you can the see the pictures themselves, mm -hmm. yeah. right and the fields themselves the grass was not disturbed right. there was nothing knocked over there was no drag marks from them so yeah, yeah it was pretty interesting and no trail yeah. cam evidence of what took them either correct yeah, yeah. he has he had a nothing trail there. cam set up where one deer was and every three seconds it would take a picture when it sensed movement and the first picture was the deer the second picture was it was moved three feet and it was just moved it but there was nothing in the camera showing you what was moving it right which was so, really strange yeah and then that deer yeah. wound up from the ground it wound up in the notch of that tree mm -hmm. which yep. was really yeah really right. strange. and Incidentally, that's where we put the bait in the notch of that tree, but we'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, the, I, I might be getting a little ahead of us, but you, you know, yeah. you uh, you look at well, and, and the broad spectrum. There, there are also mechanical-looking things in in some of his images. Uh, yeah. A, a UFO like a turtle shell zipping around a tree. Some other kind of machine or device just sort of slightly above the ground. Uh, just uh, bizarre. But then you have you have these. Well, dogmen, whatever they are. I mean, Lee has seen them. Other people have seen them. Mm -hmm. But they, they act like wild animals to a degree. They, they apparently eat bait. They, they, they uh, eat, uh, uh, you know, or at least take uh, dead carcasses. Uh, yep. Yet, somehow, either they're able to or some other intelligence is able to manipulate the uh the cameras so we it, 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 there was a couple times when you see kind of a silhouette of what might be one of them it's something uh, uh that you've got on your uh uh your video but mm -hmm. yep. it just it just uh it just, it just it's mind-blowing to try i mean I, i'm sure everybody here has tried to understand or figure out what the hell is going on and how to make sense of this but mm -hmm. on the one hand you have these things that act like animals, but then there's some other sort of a, a high technology or some kind of a cloaking going on. I was just going to say cloaking device or something's going on there because uh, that was one of the theories there. And I had said to Lee, I said, Lee, you know, could this be like a another Skinwalker ranch? Could this be and could this be a portal? And he absolutely believes that. And, well, you know, it, it kind I mean, that's kind of where you're led. And yeah. uh, on, on the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, the uh, the book, The Hunt for the Skinwalker, is fascinating. And I recommend it to everybody by Colin Kelleher and uh, George Knapp. And that was when the Robert Bigelow's uh, uh, National Institute for Discovery Science was uh, on the property that, that they bought from the Shermans for several years and documented hundreds of paranormal events. None of them ever seemed to repeat. But uh, if you if you if you look at certain aspects of the Skinwalker Ranch, you could say, well, it sounds like E.T. or, or some kind of an extra dimensional intelligence. When you look at the broad spectrum, there's things in there like poltergeist phenomena and, and trickster phenomena, hauntings and disembodied voices. It's just but, but you kind of get that with with Lee's farm. You have something that looks like there's a certain amount of technology there, but then you have the really, really high strangeness aspect. Yep, exactly. Absolutely. And yeah. so, so when we went, uh, where, so at the, uh, so it, we got done with Lee, we were in the barn and uh, I said to Lee, I said, look, you know, if it's okay with you, we'd like to go out and do a night investigation. Now this, it was getting dark. It was probably about, oh, I don't know, about quarter after eight or so maybe. Uh, 20 yeah, after eight yeah, so and, it was already, and it was already dark it was already getting dark so 
and it was overcast and it was supposed to rain. Mm hmm. And it was, yeah, it was overcast. And then when we got out to the field, Dominic looked up and said, my God, it's completely clear. And then the <laughs> first, oh, so the first things that happened when we got out there was number one, before anything, Scott was trying to hook up his GoPro and to try to, he had it on the bait site where we had the state bones and he wanted to record what was going on there. He could not link up the phone in some weird way. It, he had no problems with this thing before, but he couldn't get it to connect and he couldn't get it to record. So yep. he couldn't get it couldn't get it to record any, you know, th from there. Um, later, we found out nothing got recorded. But oh, yeah. uh, so that was that was the one thing there. And so that was the first electronic disturbance. And then we get out to the field and uh, Dominic looks up and goes, what the hell is that? And we look up and here it's a solid round orb, like solid l white light over the field. Mm -hmm. And you know it wasn't. You could you could tell it was not a plane because the plane you could see other planes in the area that they were blinking. They were blinking lights. This was a solid white orb going right over. And we're looking at it. We're trying to make sense of this thing. All of a sudden, it does a forty-five and disappears. <laughs> wow! And com and completely was, disappears. And it was heading heading towards a plane. And it was moving yeah. Yeah. three to four times faster. That's right. I remember that. Plane was. And, I, and I just kept saying, Aaron, I'm like, what the hell is that? I just kept yeah. saying that. And I mean, we were all looking at it. Scott got it on camera. Right. At least he had the forethought to record it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was just, and then it just disappeared. It was amazing. You know, it is amazing that you guys in both your investigations and Bray Road and the Pine Barrens, you guys hit pay dirt both times. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and for all the times that the cameras or the electronic equipment didn't work, you were actually able to capture some things oh. happening. You know, they, they well, did work at times. Yeah, well, thank God. I mean, the camera was working all the time. Our video camera, well, that was fine. That was working no problem. You know, thank God for Sony. So so that was working. <laughs> yeah. And But even I had bought these new uh, lavalier, uh, wireless lavaliers. And mm -hmm. uh, so we were using them for the kind of the first time on this investigation. And man, I, I love these lavaliers. They're called Cinco. And if anybody gets a chance to check those out, it's a great company and they really are really great. But that was what picked up what we heard in, in the, the second round of high strangeness here was after we saw the light, we were all of a sudden we heard this ungodly howl in the distance now this was in the distance so it was it was far away dominic and i and you could see us looking i mean all of this on that video with, that you see during this investigation that was all real time oh yeah and dominic and i dominic and i looked at each other ellen's look still looking up at the at the light trying to figure out trying to wrap her head around what's going on there and there's a, a another strange story about that as well but um so we hear this howl in the distance that was one then we heard another one a little closer. Dominic goes to Ellen, are you hearing this? And she goes, yeah, it's coming from over there. And with that, we hear this and you could hear it on the video and it picked, it was so loud, our lavaliers picked it up. So it was yeah. even louder. It was even louder when we were there. And oh, yeah. this was this was not a coyote. It was not a wolf. It was nope. some kind of, a scream it was like a, a guttural like scream it sounded like a man screaming out there to be honest with you like a not even like a, a man because i don't know even a that. guy that could do that <laughs> no it was just like some kind of it was just a very strange never heard anything like that before in our lives no and it it sounded like a train whistle almost with just mm -hmm. a, a little bit more guttural yeah and it, it sounded like you guys were in a an old black and white horror film and you're out yeah, there yeah. Night, and you hear the werewolf seriously i mean it was yeah. uh, and i'm trying to think of could that be i mean i'm not an expert in uh in animals or anything but it didn't sound like a, a coyote to me either no it no, wasn't you know, a definitely and, and not the thing with it was is you know even a werewolf you know even in the movies you always hear the tone change right when they're howling and right. but this was just no tone change it was just one solid long whatever howl scream and there 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 was no break 
There was nothing in it. It was just loud. And you- Scott, you know, we're Eric. Eric was like, what the hell is that? And he starts walking away to go get some other equipment. And Scott, I'm like, get over there, start filming that way. And Scott <laughs> turned the camera, started filming the corn. And Eric, when he went and rewatched it and was editing, he's like, we got eye shine. Yeah. yeah. You could see the eye shine. And it yeah. was but up. Yeah. It was how, up how, how tall six, was it? Seven feet. Six, it seven was, feet yeah. in the air. Yeah. 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 At feet. least it was high up in the trees because it was, you can see oh, there's, there's, yeah, you could clearly see there's a farmer, uh, there's a farmer's light in the distance. That's, mm-hmm. that's definitely a farmer's light. In the, but close up, there were there were lights and you could see them. If you look at that again, you could see the the eyes kind of dancing in between the corn and between the woods there. Um, and the way it looked, the way I tried to capture that and zoom in on it, it looks like one light, but there was actually two lights there. Oh, I mean, yeah. two eyes yeah. there. Lights, so, yeah. and so that was that was amazing that we that we caught that. And Dominic had said to Scott, "Shine the light over there because if we shine it over there, we'll probably get some eye shine in that area." And that's what Ellen was looking for, too. They were looking for eye shine. Yeah. Meanwhile, we're hearing at the same time, we're seeing the eye shine. We're hearing rustling sounds coming from behind us. Behind us. Ooh. Yeah. Now, yeah. that was unnerving. And it was not windy. It was not wind. So it was definitely not windy. And it was just some rustling. And Scott, God bless him, man. He was just shooting and kept rolling, man. It was great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, what but kind? Scott, I want to... I'm curious and, and, what kind of a vibe you all were getting. Like, w- was the hair standing up on your arms or were oh, yeah. you getting any kind yeah. of electrical oh, yeah. feeling or anything when this was happening? Well, well you know, the crazy, the crazy yeah. thing is, when, you know, it was overcast. It was cloudy. There was lightning off in the distance. And, I mean, there you couldn't see the stars. You couldn't see the sky because it was overcast. And once we got and even fred had said this to us before that it changes at night out in the field Mm -hmm. and when we got out to the back in the field and it was crystal clear sky you could see every star and that's what drew my eyes up was wow look at that it's beautiful and that's when i spotted the whatever it was in the sky and then i mean yeah the whole that whole field the energy the everything about it changed and fred was absolutely right Mm -hmm. and when hearing the rustling hearing the howls seeing the ufo and you know everything else going on i mean yeah it it definitely was scary and yeah you know i'll admit i was i was kind of petrified you know And, and i just said to eric i'm like what is going on and then eric turns around he's like are you seeing this mist? It's oh coming up gosh. from the ground. And it was that and, was that was another thing. That was another really weird thing. And with Dominic and I, I gotta uh, say this, you know, Dominic's Dominic and I, and I just had a I did a podcast yesterday, as a matter of fact, about this subject because Dominic and I are, you know, we practice martial arts and we've we've had that our whole lives and that philosophy and to stay, you know, our philosophy is to stay calm in the chaos. So yep. basically, um, that's what we did. That's that's kind of what took over, Brandy, what you were talking about as far as that feeling goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, I was like kind of trying to stay calm. I know we were trying to wrap our heads around it. I didn't I knew we were in a dangerous situation. And um, Ellen was there and she dove into the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, I'm going to tell you, Ellen is not only a great Ellen is not only a, tr- a great truck driver, she's a great truck diver. Yes. <laughs> I don't know yeah. what I was going to accomplish by doing that. Cause it certainly could have got me in the truck. But, you know, after two minutes, I said, I can do this. I'm going out there. I can do this. And then I went right over by the bait site with my flashlight. Like, I, I kept thinking to myself, how stupid is this? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, Steve, you know, this is what, Steve, I talked to Stan Gordon. You had mentioned Stan Gordon yes. and Stan and I were talking about, Stan was very interested in what was going on out there too, because he has had a lot of cases where the same uh, elements have happened right. as far as the mist goes and as far as like these creatures go. He said, even if we had a gun, 
it probably would have not done any difference. It would have made no difference. Oh, yeah. Because if we're talking about interdimensional beings, there, there, there's no way. Uh, he had a case back in the 70s where a woman saw a Bigfoot and it appeared out of nowhere, out of this blinding you know, light. And all of a sudden it's right there, literally on near her front porch. Well, she just happened to have a shotgun because she lives in the mountains of Pennsylvania. And uh, so she took takes the shotgun, takes a shot at it, and it completely disappears. And it reappears again in, in a big flash of light, disappears, and it reappears about, you know, 50 feet away. Yep. So very, very strange. So that could be like, you know, that other, another portal type idea. But I really believe what we were experiencing that night was some kind of portal activity that was going on and that we were inside some of this activity that, and like Fred had said, I forgot to mention to you too, uh, Fred said something and I, I'll never forget it. And he was so right. He said that the, the property changes at night and yeah. boy, yeah. boy, does it ever, man. That, that so, sounds like something the gypsy woman would have said to right. Lon Chaney Jr. <laughs> in a werewolf yeah. movie. Like, and Steve, you know, Steve, <laughs> and, and Steve, a lot of times in our videos, you know, we'll have to use sound effects and stuff like right. that for, you know, we didn't need any sound effects for this at all. No, no, not at all. It was like it was there. It was there. And that was that was the most unnerving part that it was actually there. And yeah. so finally, I just said, look, guys, you know, we got to get out of here because, you know, just at that point, logic takes over and says, look, you know, the safety of everybody is really important here than an investigation. So let's get the hell out of here. And how, so many, we, how long did you actually stay there from the time you said 25 minutes? What's 25 what? minutes. Really? 25 yeah. minutes. I'll be damned. Yep. You know, when, when you guys left, I was I was I was yelling at well, I wasn't yelling at the computer, but I said, no, you got to stay till sunrise. Now, I said that <laughs> and, and, and safely ensconced between four walls talking to my computer with the you know, ambient temperature and a nice hot cup of coffee. So I, I, you can be you can be very brave when you when you're in that situation. Dude, come on, Steve, tell the truth. You were in a bubble bath with a glass of wine. <laughs> no, you know what? I was out of bubble Bonbons. bath. <laughs> but but you know what? <laughs> there's another there's another catchphrase on your videos. It's it's the one Dominic utters. He says, Mantel, what the hell did you get me into? <laughs> yeah, I say that a lot. <laughs> but, but, and but seriously, uh Dominic, uh remember the analogy you gave me when you were first on when you know things were still kind of top secret. Uh, Eric yep. was editing the, the video. It was going to come out on Halloween or about Halloween. You told me, I asked you as a sensitive, what were you feeling out there at, on that field? And and you remember what you said about yeah. the shark? Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. It's it definitely, um, you know, you, you could feel a presence. You could, mm -hmm. you could definitely feel we were being watched. And, you know, definitely we were in harm's way. And really? Okay. I, I, I said you said, you, said you felt like you were in a, a, a diver's suit in a shark cage, but you were holding yeah. the bait. Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and that, you know, that's, that's what I mean by, you know, we were in danger. And I said to Eric, you know, was it a good idea to put the bait right there and set up camp right in front of it? <laughs> no. Uh, you know, I said. Well, that's we been tell for you. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we were not prepared. I mean, we we didn't have anything really to protect ourselves. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, we had lights. Yeah, we had a camera. We had a truck, <laughs> which, yeah, but, you know, we couldn't but, even get into if we wanted to. Thanks, <laughs> Ellen. Uh, <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, that, but, that could be a new Olympic sport, truck diving. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and but, being that. And yeah. here's the kicker is Ellen's ju jumping into the truck and forgetting all her motherly instincts, leaving her son outside <laughs> holding <laughs> the camera. <laughs> Scott, we'll see. we're like, we're like, Scott, we'll see you in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what I told Donna Fink. I said, Donna, if you ever want to take me on one of your investigations, I'm the guy that moves the slowest. So you guys would be out of there six or seven furlongs ahead of me before I'd even sense danger. So there you go. Yeah. It was, and the the reason why I left, Steve, just because of the fact that we kept hearing this rustling sound, I said, you know what, and we kept hearing it around us, and it felt like we were being moved in on. Yeah, and I think there was more than one one of these things out there, or one thing moving. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. fifteen hundred wow. yards away, 
at least 1500 yards away was the first howl scream that we heard. And then the second one was less than 150 yards. Oh my gosh. And, and we still were hearing another one behind that one. Wow. So yeah, it definitely, you know, I said to Eric, we, what is it? We got to get out of here. There's no yeah. way we're sticking around. And I mean, we stuck around for a little bit more, but it was, it definitely, it was intense. Now, Eric, you, you know, got a little bit unnerved too, and you usually don't get unnerved in these no. investigations. No, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty cool, you know, under pressure there. But, uh, but that when I, like I had mentioned before, when I was a kid, I got attacked by two Dobermans, and uh, that was very, that that was pretty traumatic for me. And uh, so, you know, when I hear that howl, it brought those that fear factor, PTSD kind of moment back, you know. And uh, and I said, wow, you know. That's why, but we stayed out there. We still stayed out there, even after we heard that, um, because, you know, I was as curious as everybody else to find out exactly what the hell this was. But then when we, when we realized, look, we've got no protection. We, there's, we don't even have bear spray, nothing, you know, we've got nothing. <laughs> uh, so I said, you know, we gotta, we gotta get out of here. And uh, so we beat feet and got out of there. And then we went back to the hotel and then we recapped back at the hotel and each one of us, I mean, and everything we listened to it, we listened to make sure that everything was on the uh, video camera and we were able to hear it. We could not believe that we got everything that that, you know, was that we saw that night. It was all, all on the camera. Yeah. But now the strange, the strange thing, Steve, yeah. the strangest thing is. So the night that night, the entire town of Elkhorn, the power goes out. Yep. Oh, that's right. Yep. Completely out. And. I found a stick in my room that I brought back from the uh, field. <laughs> so Dominic, Dominic says, what the hell did you bring back? <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, we it got up in the morning and the, the lights in the hotel were flickering on and off sporadically. Huh. And um, poor Ellen had, and poor Ellen had to take Scott back to the airport and pitch black. Yeah, we we yep. traced down the uh, down the staircases, you know, in pitch black. And uh, oh the guy God. said, he said, I'm so sorry. And, and uh, you know, it started it like um, I think Scott said it started about 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. It started yeah. the kitchen and then it just went totally out, you know, because it was hot in those rooms. And yeah. Uh, yeah. what the heck is going on here? Yep. Um, so let me, let me uh, uh, do my quick uh quick break here intermission and then uh i've got a question for dominic but uh, hold your place because we'll get right and back to one, and i have one more thing i want to tell you too not now but when you come back about okay. what what lee texted me the next morning uh, okay you are listening to the high strangeness factor copyrighted on the paranormal uk radio network i am steve ward and brandy and i are talking to the bucks county paranormal team Eric, Dom, and Ellen about their investigations into Bray Road, and we will be talking about the Pine Barrens. Uh, go ahead, and I'll, I'll ask Dominic my question after your your uh, well the text you got. So w the next morning, I got a text from Lee, and basically he said that that trail cam that he had down by the bait site stopped taking pictures at 5:04 or something like that that night the night of the investigation and did not take another picture until seven o'clock the next morning. So it has, it has no pictures of us on there. It's got no pictures of the beast, nothing. And yeah. then, and then he said also the bones were gone. Yeah. Your steak bones. Yeah. Yep. Steak bones gone, gone, wow. totally gone. Yeah. That was creepy. Now you're sure Dominic's stomach wasn't growling. We have another explanation <laughs> for this. You no, never know, Steve. It's that morning. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I, I have a. I, I want to foreshadow the uh, the the uh, Pine Barrens just a little bit. But I want sure. to get, keep on Bray Road, Dominic. Uh, what what kind of things were you feeling there in the Pine Barrens? We won't get too heavy into it. But what what was the vibe? You know, I like I said to Eric, I felt safer in the Pine Barrens. <laughs> foot than I did out in Bray Road. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, there was that energy out there. You could definitely feel it. Um, not going to go too much into the detail, but uh, definitely there was a presence. There was more than one. Uh, there was definitely an older and then a younger presence out in those woods. Uh, so. El Ellen, uh, yeah, thank yeah. you. Uh, Ellen, uh, 
So mm-hmm. uh, have you been, uh, are you one of these people that have been sensitive all your life? You, have you had experiences all your life or were you just drawn into this as an interest? I think I was just drawn into it as an interest. I've, I've, oh, I always wanted to grow up and be an archaeologist or a paleontologist, something to do with ancient bones or forensic anthropology. And, and forensic anthropology is what I studied at UT Austin. And it was more on the primate side. So uh, I was very interested in primates and their hands and how they um, use their hands in social play and hierarchy and all that stuff. And I worked with lemurs for probably a good year oh. and a half. Yeah. And um, we were able to, uh, you know, go in and dissect gorillas and all that kind of stuff. So it was really fascinating stuff. But more on the forensic side is where our primatologist um told us, you know, that there are creatures out there that we can't explain, that we'll never be able to explain. And so, you know, and that was back in 2001. And I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to look at this. And, and then I started looking at East Texas and East Texas is just full of Bigfoot, uh, Swamp Ape, uh, you name it. You know, there are so many cryptids in uh, Texas. It's, it's uh, incredible. But you're, you're not psychic per se. No. Okay. No. Well, you know, Donna uh, Fink told me the same thing. I, I told her that I thought that if, if I went on one of these investigations, I'd be the, the guy of one in the control group, the guy that never experiences anything and perhaps even grounds out the paranormal phenomena somehow. But she what? said she's as psychic as a box of rocks and she goes <laughs> to these places and has had real experiences. So yeah. that gave me some hope that perhaps, uh, and, and I say that, that I, I would like to experience some of these things, but then I hear you guys, uh, you know, uh, getting very nervous and hearing the howls and thinking, well, maybe I'll just take up Scrabble. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do get the feeling. I mean, I, I think as soon as we all got out there that night, um, I felt uh, a sense of something was watching us. And something was there. And then you could hear the rustling, you know, in in several different places. And then you heard the howls and then you saw the mist and you thought, okay, there is something that's that's here and you could feel it. You feel like something is is putting its arms around you, so to speak, you know, and it's just kind of pulling you into that effect. And I don't know if it's because it was pitch black out there. You know, uh, I don't know if it was because we could we hear the howls if we saw the mist. You know, it was a combination of everything. But you do feel pretty eerie out there. The mist, the mist was the the mist was weird. Well, the mist was weird because uh, you know all of a sudden I also noticed that our um, the wireless mics started breaking up a little bit too. So the connections were getting lost and that was very strange. And that was another thing that was why Scott's GoPro didn't hook up and then Lee's trail cam. So there was something going on at that point too, that we couldn't really put our heads around it. And I mean, believe me, Steve, after, after we got back for, I mean, and we're still wrapping our heads around it, but for a good week after Dominic and Ellen, I all were like, what the hell did we, what did we hear out there? Right. Yep. You know, and still don't know and that's real that's not you know this that was a real event that happened and like i say in the video i in the beginning i said you know this is the all these things happen is true you know whether you whether you believe them or not so uh, go ahead (laughs) go ahead steve i'm just going to say i would have found the mist unnerving even should it be just due to you know basic atmospheric conditions uh you know the you hear the uh uh I'm a little, little, little more nervous about being out in some of these places after reading several of the missing 411 books by David Politis, because right. those are some really bizarre disappearances. And right. even if you go back in history about the mist, uh, Elias Owens in Welsh folklore, I think 1880 or something like that, he talks about how wayfarers on the road, if they encountered a mist at night, they were... Uh, they were they were afraid because time sometimes and of course there they blamed it on the fairies would grab them take them up in the air and deposit them somewhere to confuse them on their way home sounding very mm-hmm. much like a modern day abduction but you have that well, missed connection yeah. again wow yeah. absolutely oh yeah absolutely and you know i talked to and i interviewed uh kathleen martin which was the niece of betty and barney hill 
And you have the Betty and Barney Hill UFO abduction case, September 1961. And, you know, similar situations like that. I mean, you know, a lot of those situations, you've got um, not only Betty and Barney Hill, you've got Travis Walton, all these people that have experienced these, you know, alien abductions or the abduction experience. There's got to be something to it. I mean, for the, the thing with Betty and Barney Hill was they were having the same dream about what happened, although they didn't know they weren't telling each other initially what, you know, after the experience. Right. They just right. I mean, in their experience, they were just you know, they they were coming back from a trip to Niagara Falls. They were coming back to New Hampshire and going through the White Mountains. They saw this UFO and then it you know, a series of things happen, but in their experience into the real time experience that they were, they were experiencing this, they basically just were like taken off the road. They went off the road and then they woke up from these series of beeps and then discovered they were two hours, you know, uh, beyond the time that they should have been home. Well, within that two hour time frame, a whole hell of a lot more went, went on. And, so that's the dreams that Betty and Barney were having. And then finally they started talking about it and their dreams were identical. And then they went under hypnosis. Each one went under separate hypnosis. And those, if you listen to those hypnosis sessions under on, they're on, I think they're on YouTube. I mean, that's some of the most chilling. You'll, you'll have tears in your eyes for what Barney's going through. And this is just like unbelievable stuff that people don't even know about. Yeah, he, um, he was in terror. Did you ever see the film, The UFO okay. Incident? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. They, they they were able to listen. Uh, James Earl Jones, who played Barney and Estelle Parsons, yeah. that played Betty, were able to yeah. listen to those tapes and they yeah. mimicked them perfectly. Oh, my yeah. God. They were they were. That was one of my favorite movies. And that was just, you know, it's amazing that they haven't done another movie like that, which I'm, I, I'm shocked about. And they did um, it so well. They didn't just focus yeah. on the on the abduction event. They got into their right. life and they showed exactly. them that they were they were just normal people like everybody else with problems and, and concerns. And uh, right. And, and I mean, and even back then they were an inter interracial couple. 1961. Of course, that wasn't looked on favorably back then. And they didn't want to have any kind of publicity, you know. And right. uh, so that's why they kind of stayed, you know, out of the limelight. And basically what happened was, I think, um, Betty had told uh, a friend of hers about the experience with a friend wound up telling uh, Look Magazine <laughs> and they wound up doing a story on yep. it and they didn't, even, they didn't even realize they were in the story. Um, but yeah, that that whole series was is incredible. I mean, just the experience. And Kathleen um, has a, I think on her website, she's basically got a map all laid out of their entire trip, like where they where they were taken off the road, where the ufo landed where they were taken into the ship so all of that stuff is amazing and i mean so much so that up in that area they have a roadside marker uh, memorializing that the betty and barney hill incident took place here so i mean that yep. and that was yep. one of the very first uh experiences there and then that was kind of like the first time that we're talking about the grays also that people you know betty described the the gray aliens that people are talking about now but before that, nobody was even talking about them. So right. That, the, the other entities people were seeing were quite a bit different. If you go back in the history, it's like the grays came in at a certain point more in mass. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, so the and whole, one other thing. Oh, go ahead. I, go ahead. Eric. Uh, the, the, I'm just saying the whole thing was just amazing. And, and the other thing is, if you read the book Captured by Kathleen Martin and Stanton Friedman, and also uh, a, a couple chapters in UFO Dynamics by Dr. Bertrand Schwartz, the stuff that happened to the hills afterwards, we won't have time to get into it, is even more bizarre than the abduction experience. And oh that's my something God. You, you can read about. It's just just amazing. Go uh, back, go back even further and read The Interrupted Journey. Yes. Which is phenomenal. And that gives you like I like to look at all the I like to read the older books when they first came out, because there that's when you get the unfiltered version. As yes. the years go on, they filter these versions down and it's like they they take out all crucial information that was that was vital to the case. But but if you get the uh, first edition of these books, it usually has everything in there that you uh, could possibly want.
uh, Brandy, did you want to get in here? I, I know you probably have like a million questions, <laughs> <laughs> and I've been uh, I've been hogging it. I've been I feel like I'm you know I, I'm having too much fun that you know the kids that have that little you know, the rides in the in the mall or whatever you have to get the quarter in to have fun. Damn you! Well, I, I'm looking for the place to put the quarter in, and there's, there's damn, you, damn you, Steve! Damn you! But go go ahead, Brandy. <laughs> well, I I kind of wanted wanted to get back to the mist uh, for just a second, if we could. Yeah. Um, only Pretty because it down. sounds to me <laughs> <laughs> like it's some kind like um an elect an electronic fog, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, which is I, you know, what little I know about it, it's is like a a mist or a fog that's generated because of electrical activity, um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and um, the fact that, you know, you folks were having trouble, Scott was having trouble, and the these cameras ended up not working, and then you, strange, strange as it seems, took the stick, and then the power went out at the hotel. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it all kind of fits together with, um, you know, some, some of the reports even of the people flying through electric fog in the Bermuda Triangle and how they're right. how everything's yep. displaced and not working correctly and they can't get a compass bearing and they find out they're two hours, you know, right. late or and the really weird thing to me is that the very night before when Steve and I went out to the farm, it was torrential rains. It was torrential rain. I mean, wow. we were completely soaked and I thought we cannot, there's, they're not even going to have this hayride because it's, it's raining so hard. We got to the farm and it hadn't rained there at all. There was not a speck of rain at the farm. And yeah. then my vehicle lights, while we were watching oh, yes. the pictures, while we were watching the photos in the barn, my vehicle started flashing its lights on and off. And somebody said, hey, Lee, uh, there's a car out here whose lights are flashing on and off. And he said, oh, that happens all the time out here. Well, it wow. was mine. Wow. It was my car. And it continued to do that for the rest of the night, even when we got back to the hotel. Wow. It continued oh, wow. to flash. So, so now I'm thinking, okay, like my vehicle was affected somehow. Your equipment was affected. We brought... Mm -hmm. We each in our own night brought it back with us to the hotel and then it continued to affect us throughout the night. I I just it's, I don't know what to make of it, but I just uh, don't think that that's. Yeah, no, it's cra that was crazy. Oh, yeah, I think um, it's all connected because now here's the other thing. So you're talking about rain. So it, it had cleared up by the time we were out there. Well, at 10 o'clock, it's kind of like, it's a good thing that we stopped when we did because it was torrential rain at 10 o'clock. Oh night. my gosh. Yeah. So we couldn't, yep. we couldn't even be out there if we wanted to. It was like Scott had a go, had a uh, drone with night vision ready to go that we wanted to get up there and we couldn't even use that. So, mm. but, but that's uh don't count us out yet, <laughs> but that's um Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. so a lot of those a lot of those things there is something to do something with that electronic fog yeah. with like you just mentioned with Bermuda Triangle. Uh there was that gentleman that that flew his Cessna through the clouds and wound up somewhere like you know, in Florida and he was he was in Miami in a matter of seconds or something. So um it, there's all I think there's some kind of truth to that. What it is, I mean we're still wrapping our heads around it. Right. it you know how I know this was not a scripted video. <laughs> You guys, you guys didn't separate the whole night. You stayed together. Oh, if this had been on the yeah. Sci-Fi Channel, <laughs> Ellen would have said, "Oh, what's that moving over there?" She would have walked off, and Dominic be looking the other way, and she'd turn around and say, "Where's Ellen?" Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That was, then, that was the then, one of course, thing. Ellen Eric. would be gone. You know, the actress, whoever played her, would be and, done. And we would have had, and we would have had, and we would have had a scene, and we would have had a scene where. Like we're looking around the, we're hearing all this rustling going on. We turn around, the flashlight goes on this face, and it's Steve Ward in the corn. <laughs> well, listen, I I have struck terror in the heart of many people, even in broad daylight. <laughs> Lurking. Steve, and Steve, Steve, I joke, I joke like that, Steve, because I know you're a great guy too, and I know you have a great sense of humor, and it's uh, so great that we all connected here. <laughs> well, yes, it it really is. And, uh, you know, when I, I think back to uh, 
uh, I, I worked in a little crummy little factory back in the in the 70s, just north of Detroit. On my breaks, I'd be reading John Keel's Strange Creatures from Time and Space, drinking oh, yeah. hot chocolate from the coffee machine. And, you know, I look at this now and, and look at how much fun we're having. And I, I get to talk to I get to have great co-hosts like Brandy and, and good friends that we can correspond and talk about these things. And also oh, yeah. I get to talk to people like you guys, great researchers and great investigators. I, I never dreamed this would have happened. Well, you know what? You keep putting it out there and things happen. You know, you just uh, what we try to do is we just connect with great people. And that's what we've done. That's I mean, one of the things. That's why we were able to do this, because we connected with Ellen. Ellen's incredible person. So it's, you know, and all of these things came out of this. And this investigation was just one of our our best yet. I mean, the evidence is clear. I mean, it was just it was all it was there, um, like, you know. Can we move a little bit to the Pine Barrens? When, when, and we can oh, yeah. always, if, if you guys think of anything else about the uh, Bray Road you want to bring up, don't, don't worry about it. Just, just do it. But uh, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the Pine Barrens investigation. Well, let's see. Um, we had gotten a call. Uh, well, last year, I guess la it was last year. Um, my Bigfoot researcher friend of mine, Eric Spinner, uh, he's down in the Pine, in uh, Medford, New Jersey and has gotten so much evidence uh, on his own, in his own right, of, uh, he's got hair samples, uh, footprints. There's been a lot of reports down there, and this is no, no, uh, nothing new. People are seeing Bigfoot in the Pine Barrens. A lot of times uh, we, you know, we were thinking, well, you know, there's the Jersey Devil. Everybody's talking about the Jersey Devil. Could that be, and there's definitely something there. Like Dominic said, Look, we don't want to go down to Jersey Pine Barrens and we don't want to piss anybody off that, you know, that they are, you know, familiar with the Jersey Devil. We know that and we know that there's something there like that. But then with all these these reports of these strange, all these other things going on, uh, there's got to be something else there. And I had always thought in my mind that Bigfoot and the Jersey Devil were sort of like one and the same. And I'm not. You know, I'm not the only one that's thinking that. There's a lot of people that have been thinking about that lately. Um, so just just to be honest, just to uh, reiterate, to go back to that, we just did this investigation on October 11th, and it was, yeah, I mean, not too much longer after we got back from Bray Road. I will say this though, the 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 howls that we got at Bray Road, um, Eric Spinner got uh the same on a on a recording device of on his own he got the same howls the night before but he was in new jersey so when you when you listen to these they really to the human ear anyway sound virtually identical similar I, i'm not going to say identical i think what the the one that he got it sounds like a tr like a train whistle, but it's a it's it's a definite vocalization. But it's it sounds like a train whistle, uh, uh, a low pitched whistle sound. OK, but far, far off in the distance, but it's a similar tone quality. I'll say that. Would you say so, that neither neither Howell was, I guess, changed in pitch? Is Was that the similarity? That was the similarity. It kind okay. of stayed like like Dominic was saying, it kind of just kept going. It kept mm -hmm. going. And that's okay. that's kind of like what this did. Okay. Um, so that was and that was fascinating to me because we were I mean, here we are. We were there on Saturday. He got his. Uh, oh, yeah. So the night before the investigation. So he got his on Saturday night, the 2nd of October. We got ours the next day. Wow. Wow. So was, now, th these guys. These guys are really interesting. I mean, they've been doing this for a long time. And mm -hmm. as, as you talk about this, would you uh, talk about I mean, they, they weren't uh, shy about talking about the, again, the high strangeness aspects of this. No, they um, they were just, uh, I mean, they were talking about, we talked about uh, tree knocks, about what he, you know, he's talking about like all the things. And one of the reasons why we did the video, too, is because we wanted to let people know, look, you know, this is what these researchers are doing. They're out in the field. They're doing this. These are their methods of how they're, you know, going about it. And, uh, you know, they're talking about, you know, how they're getting vocalizations, how they're going about with the tree knocks and show, they show their tree knock technique and how it's important not to make any sounds after you do a tree knock to get 
yep. you know, some kind of a response back. So those kind of things. Um, they're talking about all kinds of stuff, Steve. That was just like it, it sounded similar, but but just like you know, we were saying there's little variations, but it's kind of a similar type thing. Um, and when people see the video, they're going to be blown away by by what happened. Which again, I'm I'm thinking to myself, Dominic. I mean, <laughs> he's like I think he's a magnet for this stuff too because. You know, these guys were even blown away that we were there. They could not believe that it was so, I'll say it was so very, it was very active that night. And these guys were blown away. Well, you know, yeah, it, I mean, is, was... it is possible that, I mean, uh, going back to John Keel, he felt that certain people were more tuned in to some of these things and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, could see the, he, he used the, the literary device of the super spectrum, that people could see further into this. And I have yep. talked to experiencers that said that uh, when they would, would spend time with other people that weren't experiencers, if they spent enough time with them, they would also start to experience things or be sensitive. So it mm -hmm. is possible it's all Dominic's fault. <laughs> again, again. <laughs> I'm glad I got big shoulders. <laughs> uh, another fine mess you've gotten us into, Dominic. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But it, it is, it's very cool, though, seriously, that, you know, uh, there are some people out there that'll, that are uh, out these, these places, even hotspots for hours, and don't experience anything. And you guys are kind of like a TV show, you know, where you show up and the stuff is there. And yeah, you know, always. The thing. I mean, we were sitting there, we, we drove out and I said to Eric, when we were going out to the Pine Barrens, I said, Eric, we'll take my truck because it's four wheel drive. And I'm like, your little Toyota, it's not going to make it. And we, we met up with, with Eric Spinner and we met up with Art and he's like, yeah, we're going to drive back a couple miles in the Pine Barrens. It's been dry. It's been, it'll be an easy ride out there. There's some sugar <laughs> sand, but it's not bad. We started driving back, and I wouldn't even call them puddles. They were like ponds oh. <laughs> that we, we drove yeah. through. And I said, to Eric, it's a good thing we brought my truck. <laughs> He's like, There's no way my car would do this. And as my truck is bouncing up and down, going over all these ruts, we were oh, yeah. five miles. We are five miles from the road in the Pine Barrens. Man. And I said, I said, Eric, it's a good thing we brought the truck. But yeah, I mean. So it was that's amazing. a good point, Steve. That's a good point Dom makes too. We were five miles into the Pine Barrens by truck, five miles, and then we got out of the truck, and we went about six, uh, about six hundred feet into the uh, woods to uh, set up base camp. It was it was dead quiet, dead quiet. Mm. Yep, and it was a it was an area Eric calls the spinner calls the bowl. Because right. it's basically it's a mound all the way around, really? and yeah, and that, that just that gives the the Bigfoot an area to see and an area to to feel safer at looking down on us. Now you so, guys spent some time asking about the uh, the difference between the Jersey Devil and Bigfoot. Perhaps there, some people are seeing the same thing. And uh, uh, what was that discussion like? Yeah, with the uh, the one researcher uh, that his name's Art, the the problem that he had with it was um, that he's never gotten consistent. He's done a lot of Jersey Devil research, but he's never gotten consistent reports of what the uh, the creature looks like. You know, he's gotten reports that it could look like it's as small as a turkey, that's all like reptilian type thing, or twelve foot tall human covered in hair. So it, it never was, never was a thing. But with his experiences, he's of the thinking that uh, that Bigfoot and the Jersey Devil are one and the same creature. Uh, I, I think I, I might disagree with that a little bit. Of course, I haven't been out there, but there, there have been some, uh, even on Monster Quest, they had some people, witnesses that went under, under hypnosis that seemed to suggest there was, you know, some kind of a winged creature. I mm -hmm. talked to a lady that saw something like a Jersey Devil on her property uh, near mm -hmm. Charleston, uh, mm -hmm. in, in West Virginia, uh, and just about, a, you know, a, a 45 minutes from Point Pleasant. Uh, the other thing is that uh, it, it's just in some of these areas, uh, you know, take the Skinwalker Ranch, for example, and even uh, Lee Happel's property, where they're seeing more than one creature. 
it, in, in uh, when the Mothman was seen, one of the key witnesses was Tom Urey. He didn't see a winged humanoid. He saw essentially a Thunderbird in the same area. Right. So I just mm-hmm. I just think that sometimes in these hot spots, it, it may be partially due that these may, things may not all be physical flesh and blood creatures. There may be some kind of a paranormal mimicry or or reflective factor. I don't know. So I, I, I think that due to some of the reports that there probably is something else out there that may be responsible for some of the Jersey Devil sightings. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, there's definitely something else there. I mean, I was saying to Dominic, too, I was saying, look, you know, like we've heard of the, the creature, the hellhound. You know, we've heard of that, you know, in the chupacabra. We were we've always heard about that. And, you know, how the combination of what, you know, the the theory was that, well, maybe the hellhound, which is another like a wolf like creature. Right. What if hell, what if the hellhound is is like Bigfoot is using the hellhound as like a hunting dog? You know, mm-hmm. and it's those kind of ideas there. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the chupacabra. Now, a lot of those things have been proven that there is a chupacabra out there because they've got it on, they got caught it on video. Actually, one was shot, and it's a very, very strange looking creature. Um, but then they're also talking about this this thing that happened in Mexico uh, a number of years ago where uh, an alien they was cornered in the. Do uh, you remember that story, Steve, where the there was an alien that was cornered somewhere in Mexico City. Okay. And they were calling it a chupacabra, but it wasn't it wasn't that. It was this weird uh reptilian looking alien that they could not figure out what it was. And it wound up, I think it wound up dying. But this is another thing that's been, you know, that not really been talked about. Um, but and I always say in a lot of these things, there's a lot of truth to the folklore. You know, there's always a little bit of truth to the folklore, mm-hmm. uh, you know, whether it's Mothman, whether it's Jersey Devil, Bigfoot, uh, yeah. you name it, UFOs. I mean, here in, in Bucks County in 2008, we had a huge UFO flap that lasted from January to July of 20 of 2008. And, you know, we was that when those of- giant black triangles were going over. Yeah, black triangles. And I actually. And I, I'm kicking myself because I can't find. I had a phone where I was actually at home, uh, Home Depot in uh, in Oxford Valley, and that was where a lot of the sightings were taking place down in Lower Bucks County. And I'll be damned if I didn't see a triangle, black triangle like looking thing, o- hovering over the Home Depot. And it was a little bit in the distance, but then I I videotaped it, and it took off like a shot, and it oh. disappeared. Wow. And I, wow. I, not find that video for the life of me but it was there i saw it and that was that was 2000 that was like june of 2008 that was the weirdest thing i thought it was a balloon i thought it was like a black balloon like Mm. somebody was like doing some kind of advertising balloon or something like that Mm -hmm. but it was and it was a black triangle and then boom it just took off and Mm. uh and it was amazing and bill burns was was investigating on that as well that was uh that was the first year that a guy, John Ventry, uh, he had taken over as a mutual UFO network director uh, right. of Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania branch. And that was his first year. And he had all of these reports coming in. It was absolutely a madhouse. So uh, and then I was a I was a, a MUFON field researcher for a time. And uh, so and it kept, you know, and, and oddly enough, w- one of the guys in our area, uh, Tom Carey, which we talked about earlier. Yes, um, he's authority on Roswell has talked about Roswell, written a ton of books on Roswell. Well, he's also an anthropologist and we talked to him uh, after what we experienced in the Pine Barrens. Uh, Pine Barrens. Yeah. Yes. And for those people that haven't seen this, uh, uh, the, the YouTube video yet, uh, you went after you, uh, you have your, uh, your investigation, you come back to Bucks County and you're sitting there, it's kind of like uh, the debrief. You're, you're talking to Tom Carey, and it, mm-hmm. it's 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 interesting because it goes back and forth from Bigfoot to crash saucers. And uh, isn't yeah. it isn't it amazing how you look at these areas and how all this stuff you don't you don't try to force it in the same box, but it the patterns are all there. Oh, it's there. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, it's totally there. Oh, yeah. You and you, you put, you, and. And Steve, you had said something earlier, too. You said there's a lot of people sometimes that are more connected to the spirit world. And I absolutely totally believe that. And there are there are people that can see that there. There's that thin veil there. And there's people like Dominic that can see that they can feel that, 
you know, people like me, I don't have that that capability of going into an area and or going into a house or a venue and feeling like anything's happened there. Maybe if I if I tuned into it a little bit more possibly. But Dominic does that where he can kind of give us a preview, really, of what went on in that area. And it's amazing. Always amazing to me. It, it does. Does he uh, does he pick up the vibe before you even get someplace? Dominic, I don't know. Uh, uh, you ever you like know, not remote view per se, but do you have kind of an impression when you get before you get somewhere? What when I get to when I get to the the venue itself, uh, I usually start getting feelings. Before then, I try not to. Okay, um, that makes sense. I, I kind of, but the other spirit medium we work with, Karen Luchin, she gets it before she even arrives at the site, and she'll start getting things way I, hours beforehand. Wow. Um, because huh. she starts tuning into it immediately. I I try not to do it until I'm on site. And the only reason why is because I want just that site. If I if I try to tune in before then, there's so many other things that come flooding in that just is is it this place or is it this place? And it's hard to decipher sometimes. Um, because it just it floods, it's just a flood of information. So oh. I try I try to tune it out until I get there, then I can focus in on what's in front of me. And like any detective work, Steve, it's like you go in, I go in, talk to the owner, I'll get the lay of the land as far as like what's gone, what has gone on in that venue. You know, I'll get the stories and the history. I will not tell Dominic anything about that. I won't tell uh, Karen anything about that. And then we yep. go in and and we corroborate what they're feeling. And like Dominic went into this, we just did this video called the Plumsteadville Inn, Mysteries of the Plumsteadville Inn. And we went up, up onto the second floor and Dominic immediately felt smoke and fire. And like he could yep. smell it, he could taste it. Well, it turns out that the place had got, had a fire in the 60s. Wow. And in that area that Dominic, where, where we were standing, and the, the restaurant was shut down for uh, a, f a couple of years. Uh, nobody was hurt. Everybody was fine. But um, but there was a fire there. So that was interesting. Um, and then uh, just a lot of other things. Karen picked up on uh, a wire issue in another video that we did where we walked yeah. into a place and immediately she felt like there was a electrical issues here. with. And the owner said, well, it's amazing that you're talking about that because right here in the spot that you're standing we tried to pull a wire over for the security system. Well, it hit another wire that was frayed and it blew out the whole security. You know, it blew out the whole electrical thing, electrical. but it did, it did start a fire. Yeah, it, exactly. So things like that are amazing to me, you know, and it's just again, it's just more and more that we do this, the more and more we discover, you know, which is just really fascinating. Well, you guys really did your groundwork for the uh, the Bray Road investigation. You can see that oh. uh, because you know you could have just gone in, you know, and 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 ran ran the cameras and not done any preparation. But, right. Uh, uh, Brandy, you've been very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Brandy is scared. I thought, I thought maybe I thought maybe Brandy ran out of quarters. <laughs> is it, Ellen, are you still there? I'm still here. I'm, right, I'm yeah. listening to all these great stories. I love them. Ellen, I, I thought Ellen I thought Sondo. maybe you were, I thought you maybe you were opening up birthday presents or blowing out candles. Oh, it's, it's, it's Ellen's birthday today, everybody. So happy birthday, Ellen! Happy oh, birthday! Thank you. I yes. practiced my truck diving earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna expect to best. see that in the Winter Olympics. I'll tell oh, you. Hell yeah. <laughs> Uh, she's got it down, hands down. She's got it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. So there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of things going to be coming up too, Steve, in uh, for 2022, which we've got in the works right now. So um, I'm lining up a lot more videos. Um, talk to a gentleman out in Idaho who's had some Bigfoot sightings. So um, and he just told me tonight that his father and he had a uh, had a UFO sighting a number of years ago. Hmm. And uh, really interesting stuff going on out there. So it's, you know, we're living in an age, too, now where a lot of these UFO declassifications are coming out. And I think a lot more people, even more than 10 years ago, are are so open to the subject and want to talk about it because it's a it's, you know, everybody's had some kind of story as far as the paranormal goes. 
whether it's yeah. UFO, ghost story. I don't, everybody's got a story and it, it's, and they want to tell their story. So that's what we're doing here. And these video investigations are so much fun. And I love the history of all of these, uh, these incredible cases. We meet some great people along the way and uh, it's just been great. So a lot of, a lot of really cool things coming up for this year. Well, the, the production values on your videos are, are really good. And uh, Thank you. I, I encourage everybody to go check it out. Uh, before we leave, uh, Ellen, was there anything else you wanted to say about uh, the Bray Road investigation that maybe wasn't brought up? Uh, no, just that uh, we enjoyed uh, meeting with Fred the, the Saturday um, while yeah. I think Lee was doing the hay rides and stuff. He was he was just really informative. And for him to change his mind like he did, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, he's a believer. And, um, you know, and same with Lee. I think Lee approached it like uh, Dom said from the mathematical standpoint. And um, yep. he just, you know, he he's dumbfounded by all the stuff that he has, all the material, all the videos. I mean, the you know, what he has seen, it, it's just amazing. And, and he's a total believer, you know. And, so. and remember oh, yeah. how Fred, uh, when uh, Lee told him that he found these footprints starting in the middle of nowhere, Fred told him it was probably parachuted in. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah. Was, that was his sense <laughs> oh. of humor ticking in initially. Oh, but, yeah. well, but what know, about those crazy yeah. footprints? They're, they're, they're yeah. like well, single crazy. file. Yeah. And then yeah. I and guess an animal work. could yeah. do that. But then they split it way apart. Yeah. Well, well, Steve, what about those photos that Lee showed us? And you could see it on our video slightly, but he's got better pictures, too, of we saw these weird orb type things where yeah. it looks yeah. like the creature is inside these yes. orbs, like yeah. corroborating that that and talking about what just Fred just said about parachuting in. Well, they yes. maybe floated in. Yeah. Um, well, you know, amazing. Amazing. Linda yeah. Godfrey has a has a, a sighting in uh, uh, Monsters Among Us. And, Pennsylvania, Route 81, the guy's driving along at night. He sees this light moving along in the woods going to intercept the road, and he thinks it's some idiot on, a, on an ATV driving mm -hmm. recklessly in the dark and rough terrain, and then he, he can see how it's going to dip down to where the road is. But then all of a sudden, this light morphs into a six-foot dogman and takes off. Wow. So wow. if that's a you know if that's an accurate report, it would fit perfectly. And, and you know, there's there's other reports of these creatures. There's there's a, it was a in uh, in England uh, near a, a canal. These these three young kids they saw a, a strange light and it started to approach them. It came out of the mist from the uh, uh, from the canal, and they start running away. And two of them saw something like the outline of a they didn't call it bigfoot but it was big it was you could, they could tell it was hairy but its mm. legs didn't go all the way to the ground but the third one didn't see the creature he just saw the light so mm -hmm. we have a lot of phenomena like that where people experience the same thing but see it differently mm -hmm. oh definitely oh definitely uh, a couple of cases that really fascinate me real quick are, you know, the case of the Holloman Air Force UFO, uh, Air Force Base UFO landing. Um, that, that was back in the, I think, the 19, late 1950s. And Richard Nixon in the 70s, they were, he was going to declassify the UFO footage. And they had about 600 feet of film uh, on file of this UFO on Holloman Air Force Base actually landing. It was in trouble. And oh, wow. it landed. There just happened to be a film crew filming uh, maneuvers. And this thing came in from nowhere. There was actually three of them, but one broke off, came down and landed on the tarmac. And these beings came out of this, the, out of this uh, UFO. And generals, a couple of generals went out to meet these creatures. Well, nothing, after that, everything was pretty much, you know, nothing was said about it. But apparently this footage was was, uh, you know, in the Pentagon or something like that. Well, they had this footage. Well, they were going to they were going to release it in a in a movie called UFOs, Past, Present, Future. I well, remember, then, that. Course, remember that. Well, then yeah. they in that in that video, Rod Serling, he was the uh, narrator. There's about 12 seconds of video that they leaked into that into that show of that UFO landing now. It looks just like a point of light. And you can see it on YouTube. They actually have it on YouTube. Um, and it's a point of light just coming right down from, you know, from the sky 
to the tarmac and you could see it clear as bell. Um, but so well, then, of course, Watergate happened and they, they at the last second, they couldn't release that that they couldn't get that film footage, you know, unfortunately. That so that, cool. that mm -hmm. but Steven Spielberg heard about that story and that's how he came up with with Close Encounters. Mm -hmm. And that's how that's how that story came about. And another case that's really fascinated me, which I oh, I there's something to this because there's been a lot of reports of it in the 60s and the early 70s. And, and I'm not sure much uh, now, but uh, do you remember Injured Cold? <laughs> I, I'm the Moss Man guy. Come on, Eric. You know, okay. So you know, you know about this. That that has fascinated me. This is Wally Derenberger, I think his name was. He was uh, driving Woodrow. home. Woodrow Derenberger. Woodrow. Yeah. Woodrow. Yep. Yes. Yep. Um, he was driving home, and something passed him in the road. He thought it was a car that was passing. Well, it turned out it was like this, like, um, like a kerosene lamp looking type of vehicle. That it was a UFO that basically it went right past him and then kind of blocked the road. And this thing, this guy came out of the uh, out of the vehicle and up to his his window and said his name was Cold. It was his name was Injured Cold. And all he could see was this guy just with this big grin. He had this big grin on his face and was dressed in these weird like kind of clothes. And the, he, you know, that just changed this guy's life immensely. And they did a lot of like, I mean, I wish we could get that on YouTube, but there was a, uh, there was an inter interview with him um, about that. And it was actually, I, I have, I have the, uh, <clears throat> I have the audio. Uh, Susan yeah. Shepard, who we lost recently, she was okay. uh, she would speak about the Indrid Cold incident at the Mothman Festival, and she mm -hmm. has those original interviews with Der with Rod Derenberger. Now the, oh, wow. the thing is, later on, some of Derenberger's stuff, would, uh, some of his claims were kind of out there and probably dubious, but yeah. there were other cases. There was even before that one hit the news, uh, Mary Heyer, who was the the uh, reporter that uh, was a colleague of John Keel and wrote for mm -hmm. the Athens Messenger. She, uh, mm -hmm. uh, somebody came to her and said, hey, uh, I, I just got to tell somebody about this story. He told a very similar story. This is, this is a, 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 some, a short time before the Indrid Cold thing with Derenberger came out. The same mm -hmm. thing that the, the guy was in the truck with a friend. This, this thing came around, he stopped, had this pointless conversation, same kind mm -hmm. of, of character. And uh, he was going to come forth with it, but then at the last minute decided not to. And then mm -hmm. Keel was going to just forget about it. Two days later, the Indrid Cold event came out. But here's right. the other thing. This, this guy said, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, not not in, not Woodrow Derenberger, but this other guy who's unnamed. He says, you know, uh, that scientist fella said we should forget all about it. And Keel said, what scientist fella? And he said, well, this this guy, he seemed like, you know, he was talking about. He said we should just forget all about it. And Keel said, well, how did he find out about it? Because you didn't report it to anybody except, uh, you know, Mary Heyer. And he says, damned mm -hmm. if I know. And, mm. so, and then there was... Briefly, there was another incident where a woman in Gallipolis across the river, she was leaving work from the hospital. She sees this craft come down in the parking lot late at night. These two guys come out looking very much like Indra Cold, have another hmm. pointless conversation. And hmm. the next day, she sees them in town in plain clothes, and they kind of nodded at her like, you know, nice to see you again. She wow. was having she was having her own Skinwalker Ranch on her property. Animal wow. mutilations, wow. large boxcar like craft going overhead, haunting phenomena in her house. I mean, this stuff is is just uh, astounding. Oh. And oh, so yeah. there is something to the injury cold thing. But like many of the yep. contactees, it seemed like over a period of time they would uh, make up and embellish things when when the uh, incident well, yeah. stopped happening happening i, I think but, and i think he yeah he wound up embellishing that story and then wrote a book the man from uh lanulus and things uh, like uh, that. Uh, yeah visitors from lanulus yes it, yeah yeah so yeah you know and that, um, that's unfortunate but i i believe his initial story but um uh well yeah, supposedly just, other people saw <laughs> this yeah. craft and him talking to some strange man on the highway. So, right, you right. know, where I don't sometimes you don't know where the truth ends and the the, uh, you know, the the, uh, the fantasy begins. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's true. It's fast, fascinating nonetheless. But I mean, this has been so much fun, Steve. I mean, you guys are so much fun. You and Brandy are awesome to talk to. And I hope your listeners enjoyed what we uh, talked about. And I I definitely would encourage them to check out 
on our YouTube channel for Bucks County Paranormal Investigations. Yeah, the Beast of Bray Road, alive and well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, and Ellen, do you have any uh, uh, information to give out? I know that we can find you on Facebook, but do you have a, a website or anything? Working on it. Working okay. on it. Working on the Wisconsin branch okay. of uh, Bucks County Paranormal. <laughs> But yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have to check out these videos and uh, well, these gentlemen <clears throat> and uh, hopefully Ellen will be back. So Oops. this is oh, this the last time I'm, I'm going to yep. save up my quarters to make sure we don't run out. <laughs> <laughs> OK, guys, uh, before we go, anybody would anybody like to uh, say anything or contribute anything? Just want to say thank you, Steve. You guys are awesome. Dominic, Ellen, you guys are incredible. Of course, Brandy, it was so nice to meet you. And, uh, you know, let's do this again. I mean, this we've got a lot more stories to tell. We will. Oh, and it, 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 it's, it's so much fun. You guys are so knowledgeable. We can just go off in all kinds of directions and talk about everything. Yeah, oh. I'm really yep. excited about seeing all the new videos in, in the new year. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're not. We're not done with this year yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we still got a couple of things up our sleeve. Dominic oh, and I good. just checked out. We checked out a, uh, a report over at a local uh, road, a haunted road by us uh, called Hansel yep. Road. It's uh, sort of like another portal type area Ooh. that people have been seeing really. And we've gotten really? some really incredible stuff like weird lights in the trees coming down from the treetops. Well, we just discovered, we went over there the other night and videotaped everything, but we just discovered something that blew me away, and that's what you're going to see in the video. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and very quickly, uh, for people that uh, are around you locally, where do they go see you perform jazz in, in the, uh, so the places? So my jazz, my jazz quartet, people can find uh, where we're playing on my website called ericmintelquartet.com. I had a real hard time coming up with that title. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but ericmintelquartet.com and now around this time of year, November, December, we start our Charlie Brown jazz concert series. Oh, so, that's great. Oh. so we do a lot of Charlie Brown, Vince Guaraldi music around the holidays. We do some standards and a lot of holiday favorites and a lot of original holiday tunes that I've written. And uh, that's with myself on piano, Dave Antonow uh, on bass or Jack Hedgie on bass. Nelson Hill on alto sax and Dave Moan on drums and trying to get Dominic to play some tambourine and Ellen, <laughs> Miguel, and Ellen to play the uh, snare drum. <laughs> you know what Dominic's going to say? This is another fine mess you've gotten me into. <laughs> exactly. What the hell did you get me into, Mintel? <laughs> that's, that's my line. <laughs> well, Eric, Dominic, Ellen, and Brandy, Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. So much. Uh, Thank you. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. I will, I will do my close out. Everybody sit tight. The High Strangeness Factor is was created by Steve Ward and Andy Mercer and was uh, and is copyrighted by the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I want to thank our fearless leaders, Irene Allen Block and Mark Johnson here at the network. I also want to thank Andy Mercer in his dual role as regular co-host and producer. Brian Zeller composed the music. And I am Steve Ward, your humble host here on the High Strangeness Factor, a displaced yank on the Paranormal UK radio network. Thank you for listening. I will see you all again in a fortnight. Take care. <laughs>